The real challenge, I think, and where the brain power needs to come to bear is interpreting the results of it and, and making some decisions and judgments. For the climate templates, for example, you've got four different climate templates available in South Australia covering the main metro areas. These have been set up in your guidelines are available free from Water Sensitive South Australia. So they should be easily accessible. We'd expect most of the time people should be able to get these right. The music auditor just checks that you're using one of these guidelines and it will flag it if you're not. Obviously, if you're outside this, this area that's covered by these four guidelines, we would expect that you'd be using a different climate template. You're probably not using something for Adelaide if you're, if you're currently sitting in Mount Gambier, for example. The auditor will actually check every little part of these templates. It'll check the rainfall, the evapotranspiration, the start and end dates that everything's matching. So if someone's tried to set up a template themselves, but they haven't quite got it right, it'll actually flag that for you. What tends to happen is that the templates are binary. They're either matching or they're not. And if they're not, then it flags everything. And you get a big long thing like this in the auditor saying that, that nothing worked. It's not so scary. It just means they've used a climate template. That's not one of those four. Where I would accept a variation for this, obviously, if there's a, a region outside where these templates are available. And the second place is where the consultant has sat down, done their homework, come up with a good average mean annual runoff for the site based on long-term daily rainfall data, ideally multiple sites. And then they've gone back and chosen a suitable representative period of six minute data that might be 10 years long or 20 years long. They've made sure that there aren't any major gaps in that data. And they've said, we think this is a better representation of our specific area. And if they've done their homework, then I would accept that as a acceptable alternative to the template. Catchments and source notes. So these are the the nodes representing the, the catchment areas in music. What we're checking here is firstly, whether it's complying with guideline values. So the guideline at present recommends using 40 millimeters for soil storage capacity and 30 for field capacity based on the, the e-water recommendations for South Australia. And then we're checking everything else is a default. Now there's a caveat here that we would expect if you're doing high impervious fraction kind of development in the inner city, I would just stick with the defaults and, and leave it at that. However, if you are further out in the country or if you're modeling areas that have got a high pervious fraction, so a low impervious fraction, or if you're in areas particularly that are coastal and sandy, then I would think about picking up and adopting some specific soil parameters relevant for that area. So you might then adjust it to use the site soils. And there's two tables within the guidelines that have a range of different soil types and they've got nominal suitable soil parameters that you may use for those soil types. That's where I would deviate from just using the defaults and adopting those parameters. The second situation is obviously where someone's actually done a catchment calibration and worked out what those soil parameters should be for that specific calibrated area. Either way, you expect documentation justification. What are you using and why is that suitable? Have you got some geotech data to show that uh, you're, it's this particular soil type that you're dealing with and then you can show that you've adopted the, the corresponding suitable parameters from the tables in the guidelines that could be fairly straightforward as a snapshot these are some of those tables just showing that the different soil moisture storage capacities and the field capacities for some of the different soils as a general rule i wouldn't get too tangled up in this if you're dealing with mostly impervious sites and generally clay sort of soils which are probably what's predominant in most areas the the pervious area runoff is not going to make that much difference to your modeling most of the time where i would consider using it is where you've got a low impervious fraction and where you're in the sandy sort of soils and i know you've got a few areas where that becomes important so here's an example of an audit we've run. It's failed the field capacity and the soil storage capacity. What we can see here is that it's pretty straightforward. Basically, they've just used the defaults rather than using the recommended parameters. What would you do in this case? You'd probably come back and say, look, we know they're not going to make a huge difference to the result, but can you please pick up the values that are in the guideline and make sure we're actually being consistent with that? Example two, in this case, the soil properties for this node, it's development roofs going to the rainwater tank and it's picked up the field capacity and the soil storage capacity aren't complying with the guidelines. It's a roof. There's no pervious area coming off this roof. We've set it to a 100% impervious fraction. So the soil parameters are completely inactive and not doing anything at all. So does this make any difference? No. Nope. Would I spend time going back to the consultant asking them to change these numbers? No, nope. wouldn't bother.
that waste to your time, waste to their time. So it's worth exercising a little bit of judgment on the numbers you see here. You know, are these material, do they actually matter? You can fairly quickly recognize that for things like roof or road where it's 100% impervious, none of the soil parameters are going to matter. Pollutant concentrations, the guidelines at present are set up to allow for either a lumped land use approach or a split surface type where you break up the surface types being roof, road and, and general ground impervious or pervious areas. So that's that breakdown there or alternately that you're doing it with the different land uses. So depending on which surface type you're using, you might be using a different set of pollutant concentrations. So for road, you'll have higher sediment concentrations and then for roof, obviously they're going to be much lower. Whereas for nitrogen, you'll see that the differences aren't all that substantial. The way the auditor is set up at present is it will actually check all of these as a list. So it will check whether the the total suspended solids concentration mean is any one of 2.431, 1.3 or 1.8 and if it passes if it's any one of those it'll say this is okay it'll pass that check basically at the moment we've got the surface types in the auditor but we're not then checking all of the land uses and one of the reasons is that there's a ton of them and if we check all of these things you can have all sorts of things go in there that'll pass it gets hard to know what's passing and what's not but at the moment these will get flagged if they do get flagged it's fairly straightforward just to check that these are actually the commercial parameters that they're using we'll adopt those and move on one of the things we're doing with the auditor moving forward is setting it up so that it can actually differentiate the guideline values and the recommended values. So what we'll probably do with these is set them up so that if you're not following the standards, we'll give a recommendation warning if you're not following any of these, and then we'll give a guideline warning if you're not following the, the basic ones so that you recognize what's actually being used there, whether they're following surface type or land use or something else. So we'll have two levels of differentiation in future. Again, give you a little bit of an example. We've got a townhouse, they've used split surface types, they've got a roof, they've got a driveway, they've got a road. This is coming up saying that there's no errors in these two nodes, so it hasn't flagged anything. This one hasn't flagged anything for the concentration, so they're obviously using one of the ones we've adopted, and it'll be the surface types we saw above. The only thing it's flagged here is it said that the roof, you've got one hectare, and is your townhouse roof really a hectare? Probability, I'd say no. So it'll flag those for you. You might alternately get a result that says it's not complying. So this one that's come up and it flagged that the townhouse roof in this case, it's not complying with the guidelines. The numbers input are these. When we look at the guidelines, we'll see this doesn't quite match any of these inputs. We drill down and we look a bit closer and what we see is they probably meant it to be the second one here. You can see it's 1.3 versus 1.301. 0.89 versus 0.886. One of the things with the auditor is that it's quite precise. It's looking for exactly what we've told it to look for. So if it's out even by one decimal place, it will flag it. So when you're punching your numbers into music, they do need to be accurate to whatever level of accuracy is reported in the guideline because that's what we've told it to check for. These numbers are log. So they're 10 to the power of whatever this number is. So 0.1 doesn't sound like much of a variation but 10 to the power of 0.1, the differences in concentration can actually be a little larger than you might expect. So it is actually important in putting in concentrations into music that we actually respect the precision and put the precision in that's there. In all other cases, I would say with precision, round things off and don't report music results to the third decimal place because let's not pretend they're accurate to within 20% even. But one case where I would say use precision is when you're doing these concentrations because it does matter a little bit more. When are they okay? When you're adopting that specific soil type for your project, when you've got a calibrated model. Pollutant concentrations, if they're using the land use parameters, I would just check that off and say, yep, they're adopting those land use parameters. And I think what we'll probably do is just build those into the music auditor so that they're passed, whether they're a surface type or a land use check. The other situation is where they're using a really specific land use. Let's say it's a quarry or an unsealed road or something they're trying to represent. We don't currently have anything for South Australia, but they might have pulled some guidance from New South Wales or somewhere else to come up with numbers for that. Or they might have made something up because honestly, what are the sediment concentrations coming off a quarry? No one really knows. 
you'll have to make a judgment in that case whether they've adopted something that's reasonable for the particular land use they've got. 